At Porthwen Bay, the sea has eaten into rock to carve out a naturally Gothic arch. In his turn, man split off quartzite from the cliffs to mould into bricks for the industrial age. Close by, beautifully blue polluted waters fill the abandoned lakes of Paris Mountain. As always, the Bronze Age people were here first, and the Romans followed after them. During the 18th century, the mining company blasted out the new harbour of Amluch port. Soon, Paris Mountain became the biggest copper mine in the world. Rapidly, the original six houses became engulfed by the most populated town on Anglesey. Eventually, underground pipes carried crude oil from an offshore terminal to the Shell refinery in Cheshire. For 13 dangerous miles, racing tides surged through the Menai Strait between Anglesey and mainland Wales. Before the two bridges were erected, ferries carried passengers to Bumaris, whilst cattle swam across. Midstream, Stevenson's railway bridge was perched safely, we hope, on a rock which had sunk the Britannia only a few years before. Tall ships could easily sail under Telford's suspension bridge, a hundred feet above the water. At its completion in 1826, bagpipes played in celebration and the Irish mail was the first to dash across. Between the bridges and the banks, the island of the Red Weir flings out its arms to catch unwary fish and sometimes canoeists, then smokes them in its own small curing tower. Surrounded by mud and wading birds, Church Island was the peaceful retreat of St. Tassilio. In 1188, the Archbishop of Canterbury stopped at the church, drumming up money and volunteers for the Third Crusade to the Holy Land. Today, the islands reached by a causeway built by Belgian refugees during First World War. From mainland Wales, Bangor Pier stretches out for 1,500 feet halfway across the strait. Daniel built his timber church near here in the 6th century, enclosing it with a fence made of woven branches, which was termed a bangor. The saint became Bishop of Gwynedd, his church became a cathedral, and his humble fence gave its name to the city. Seen from above, Penryn Castle outside Bangor looks like the perfect Norman castle. In fact, it was built 700 years too late with the profits from the Bethesda slate quarries. Hewing slate from the mountains between Bethesda and Llanberis had been a village industry since the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Then, in the 18th century, Baron Penryn bought up all the rights and hired back the local men as his labourers. Penryn Quarry paid them 12 shillings a week. It also made a fortune which financed Penryn Castle for its owners, providing the slate for their billiard table and their one-ton bed. The finished roofing slates come in a range of sizes and natural colours. The various types have superior names, queens, duchesses, countesses and ladies and all the best judges prefer, it is said, a countess in blue to a duchess in red. Bethesda slate was transported by steam railway to a new harbour near the castle. A rival quarry above Llyn Peris exported their product from Port de Norwich. The lord of the manor was a master of hounds, a cricketer and a gentleman. By act of parliament, he enclosed four-fifths of the common land to establish the Dinorwick Quarry, depriving the villagers of their rights. They could work for him, though, in their thousands, and they lived in the new village of Llanberis. The scars of the Nantle slate quarries lie beneath the mountain of Mynydd Mawr, shaped from afar like an elephant. 
At the valley's far end, Llyn de Werchen boasts a legendary island which floats on the water. Cattle used the island as a wayward ferry, and in 1658, the astronomer Halley, comet struck, rode it around the lake. At the mouth of a river, beyond high mountains, the Spanish general Maxen Wledig discovered the castle and queen of his dreams. For seven years, Maxen lived with his Celtic wife, Helen, at the fort of Segontium, before leaving Britain to become Emperor of Rome. After 700 years, Edward I, busy with his own empire building, sighted Carnarvon Castle nearby. This new castle reflected the style of Constantinople, because Emperor Constantine the Great had been born here. One tower was topped with stone eagles, symbols of the mighty Roman army, and in it Edward's son, the first English Prince of Wales, was born. Vortigern the Tall, the ruler of Britain, having abandoned his land in Kent to the Saxons, built his castle on the cliff face of Nansguthairn on the Llyn Peninsula. When his refuge was destroyed by an avenging fire from heaven, he leapt to his death in a stormy sea. From the 19th century up to World War II, Bardsey Island had its own king. The farmers were an independent lot, and the island's owner, in fun, appointed their headman king. He wore a brass crown and had a wooden soldier to stand guard over one silver chest. Bardsey has been a pilgrimage site since the 5th century, three trips there being worth one to Rome. Along the route, Clonogvaur became a traditional centre for healing. Patients bathed in St. Benor's well and rested overnight on his tomb. Now the holy water couldn't help Mad King March of Abersoch, who had horses' ears. The king was so embarrassed that he ordered his barber to keep the secret. But the servant whispered it to the reeds blowing in the wind. Unfortunately, the reeds were made into pipes, and they sang of the king's misfortune whenever the piper played. Successfully tucked away on a beach is Porthdinlein. Above it, an Iron Age fort has been turned into a golf course, where balls shot into the rough end up in the sea. Unbelievably, this small harbour once rivaled Hollyhead as a port for Ireland. For years, these thin villages were busy with shipbuilding and fishing boats. It's only recently they've become the quiet havens of holidaymakers. In the 20th century, Pulcheli was famous for redcoats at Butlins. But it was the Black Prince, clad in black chainmail, who leased the town out to a friend in the 1300s for the price of a single rose. Howell the Battleaxe served under the Black Prince in France during the Hundred Years' War. And on his return, he became constable of Cricketh Castle. Nowadays, the castle looks over to Maddock Bay, but at that time, it protected a wide estuary. For centuries, ships could sail up the Glaslin towards Bethgelet. Then in 1808, Maddox built his one-mile cob across the estuary and reclaimed acres of marshland. The new harbour of Porth Maddox became the outlet for the Blenefistinog slate mines. So many ships dumped their soil ballast here that an islet formed in the bay, and on it grow plants from all over the world. Initially, the mines transported their slate via a tramway. Horses pulled the empty trucks back up, but they hitched a ride down on the laden wagons, which descended to sea level by gravity. <laughs> 